Hello friends, welcome to the Abrams Children's Books Fall 2020 Preview. My name is Jenny Choi, Associate Director of School and Library Marketing. In this video, we talk fiction, everything from chapbooks to young adult. One book I'm excited to share with you from this season is Tell No Tales from Sam Meggs and Kendra Wells. Think you know everything there is to know about the Pirates of the Caribbean? Think again. Meet Anne Bonnie, a 16-year-old girl who decides to throw expectation to the wind and set sail on her own. Pretty remarkable, considering we're talking about the year 1715. Anne has it all, her own ship, a loyal crew, and a fearsome reputation. But a new enemy has her on the run, and it will take all of Anne's courage to stay afloat. Readers will fall in love with the heartfelt and hilarious characters in this swashbuckling graphic novel adventure. It's a story about chosen family, facing your fears, and overcoming impossible odds. Our heroes, Anne Bonny and Mary Reed, were real-life pirates, and much of the inclusive and diverse cast of characters were inspired by real-life people and places in and around the golden age of piracy. In an author's note, Sam writes, I've always been fascinated by their true story, but what if there was just a little more? That's the question Kendra and I asked ourselves when we sat down to come up with the plot and characters of Tell No Tales. So much of history is written by the victors, and usually the victors have mostly looked the same. Straight, white, dudes. Kendra and I decided we wanted to reclaim some of our lost history, the history of women and non-binary queer folk that must have existed, but has been hidden or kept quiet for so long that it may never be recovered. So instead of waiting, we decided to create our own. What's not to love about that? And now I'll turn it over to our talented authors who will tell you more about their new books. Hey everyone, it's me, Jonathan Oxier. I write strange stories for strange kids. You might know me from books like the Peter Nimble series or The Night Gardener or Sweep. And now I have a brand new series I wanna to talk to you about. It's coming out this fall. It's called The Fabled Stables. At the top of the world sits an island. And in the heart of that island lives a little boy named Augie. Now Augie is like most ordinary kids except in one way. And that's that he has a job. And while most jobs are boring things, Augie's is far from boring. See, Augie's job is to work at the Fabled Stables, a wonderful place filled with all sorts of magical, strange, bizarre, one-of-a-kind creatures. Things like the hippopotamus, and the long-beaked curmudgeon, and the bush squid, and the yawning abyss. And it's Augie's job to care for these creatures. Now, how did all the creatures get here? Well, every so often, the Fabled Stables shakes and shudders and shifts. And when Augie steps in, he discovers a new empty stall with the name of a new creature. And it's his job to go out into the wide world and bring that creature back to the safety of the fabled stables. You see, the wide world is a dangerous place for magical creatures. There are people out there who want to hunt them and hurt them and use them for their own means. And it's Augie's job to go out and save these creatures and bring them home safely to the fabled stables. Now, the fabled stables is a sort of a departure from a lot of my other books, which are quite a bit longer for older readers, a lot bloodier. The Fabled Stables is meant for younger readers. These books are 100 pages long, but they are very short in their word count, and they have full color illustrations on every single page. We've got the brilliant Olga Demidova doing the art, and you guys, I cannot wait for you to see how gorgeous these books look in full color. And the reason I wrote this series is for the same reason I write everything. I'm always trying to write the book that I want to read in the world. And in this case, this need came out of the fact that I'm a parent. I've got three daughters. They are four, six, and eight years old. And uh, one of the things that's tricky about that is at different ages, it's hard to find one book that they will all sit through. Uh, my youngest daughter, she loves picture books. She loves books where the pages are constantly turning and there's a new bright color for illustration every few sentences. Whereas my oldest daughter wants a longer, more intricate story. Um, she can kind of handle the complexity of that. She likes wordplay and things like that. And for me as a parent, it was always really hard because I wanted one book that they could all enjoy together, but there aren't many books like that. These aren't really chapter books. They're not early reader books. The language is more complex and playful. There's a lot more wordplay, but there are 100 pages of full color illustrations. 
that every kid can be engaged with even if they are a little younger. <laughs> um, and the dream is that these are stories you can sit down and entertain the whole family with in one go. So the series starts, comes out in October, the first book, and in every single installment, Augie and his animal friends go out and save another different, strange, one-of-a-kind creature. I have loved creating this series. I've spent my whole life coming up with weird, strange monsters, and I often don't feel like I have a place to put all of these creatures. And finally, at last, I realized they needed a home. They needed the fabled stables. I can't wait for you guys to find this book and read it and discover this amazing story and this world on your own. Thank you. Hi, I'm Andrea Beatty, author of The Questionnaires, and I'm here to tell you about Sofia Valdez and the Vanishing Vote. I don't know if you knew it, but it's an election year. What? It is. And we thought it might be fun to have a book where the questionnaires have an election. So Miss Lila Greer decides it's time for the kids in her classroom to have a pet and to decide what pet they're going to get, they hold an election. Sofia Valdez is in charge of the election, and it starts off fine at first. They have all kinds of wonderful candidates, from dinosaurs to the Chrysler Building, to turtles, to birds, to great white sharks, all kinds of options. But when it comes down to Rosie's bird idea or Ada's turtle, things start getting a little stressful, and there starts getting to be tension in the classroom. And then when the election's held and a vote goes missing, things go wild. What will happen? I don't know. Well, I do know. You don't know, but I know. It's fun. Uh, we had a great time making this book, illustrated by David Roberts, as always. He's marvelous. And also at the end of the chapter book, as in all of the ch Questionnaire's chapter books, there's some nonfiction material. There's poetry, some history, all kinds of goodies for you and for your students. And in this book, we get to meet the marvelous, magnificent librarians of Blue River Creek, both at the school and the public library. And I think you're going to love them. I know I did. Thank you very much, and I hope you really enjoy Sofia Valdez and the Vanishing Vote. Happy election! Hi, I'm Henry. And hi, I'm Lynn Oliver, and we are the co-authors of the Alien Superstar books. Henry is holding up the first one. Wait. And we have written our second one, Lights, Camera, Danger. And this is the second volume uh, that tells the story of Buddy Berger, who is an alien who comes from a faraway planet and lands smack dab in the middle of Universal Studios' back lot. And what happens to him, Henry? So here's the thing. You know, um, he has a job on a, a situational comedy right now on Universal Studios, but the planet, the government on his planet cannot allow him to escape because then other people will get that idea. So they send this really, really terrible um, uh, um, commander, uh, a shapeshifter, to come and take him back to the planet. So the second volume is the story of Buddy's resistance, of how he manages to escape this evil presence who has come to Earth to capture him, and how he enlists the help of his friends, of his human friends. And they have very, very exciting chases all the way throughout that will keep kids on the edge of their seats. And in the end, what happens, Henry? Well, in the end, um, uh, Buddy uh, wins and gets to stay on Earth. Uh, the, uh, the commander, the shapeshifter, is put in a concrete cell and all you see is her long finger scraping at the cement in order to get out, maybe in book three. And the thing is that our book is in this one, the second book, uh, underneath the comedy, is a story of friendship. How far will friends go to help Buddy? And Buddy learns what it really means to be a friend. And it's a story of courage and facing your enemies and of resilience and of creativity in solving problems. And all of that is couched in what we believe to be a really 
hilarious adventure that kids will have. <laughs> hilarious. Hi, Larry. <laughs> well, you know, we try to be funny. That's true. Yeah. We, are, we want to thank all of you for supporting the first book so beautifully and also for continuing in your line of work, bringing books and stories and reading and education to kids during these times. It's really been a challenge and we are so thrilled to see how the education and library community has risen to meet it. And not only that, but on behalf of both of us, uh, we wish you uh, only healthy thoughts uh, for you, uh, for your families. Uh, what a strange time we are in. But when we get back to whatever normal will be, what you do will be vital uh, in a more social world. Thank you. It was wonderful seeing you. Bye. Hi, I'm back. What's an Abrams preview without a Dire of a Wimpy Kid update? It's double the fun and double the last this fall as we have two, two books from number one international best-selling author Jeff Kinney. Adventure awaits in Rowley Jefferson's awesome friendly adventure. You've never seen the Wimpy Kid world like this before. Join Roland and his best friend Garg the Barbarian as they leave the safety of their village and embark on a quest to save Roland's mom from the White Warlock. And now I'm pleased to share with you the cover of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, book 15. Is Greg Hefley in over his head? Find out in The Deep End. And now, back to our authors. Hey, my name is Lila Sales, and I am the author of The Campaign, a political comedy which is illustrated by Kim Balakwit. The Campaign is about a 12-year-old girl named Maddie, who doesn't really like school. She feels like she doesn't have a lot of friends there. She can never do anything right. She doesn't get good grades. Pretty much the only subject that she really loves is art class. So when she finds out that the only candidate to become mayor of her town in the fall is planning to defund all arts education in the public schools, she knows that she has to stop this person. She tries a variety of ways, and ultimately what she comes up with is convincing her babysitter to run to be mayor of their town. Maddie then winds up running the campaign for her babysitter, and in fact involving all sorts of other kids from her school, discovering a community that she didn't know she had, and discovering a whole bunch of skills when she thought that the only thing she could really do was art. I wanted to write this book for a couple reasons. Um, I've always loved stories about kids doing things that you wouldn't normally expect kids to be able to do. So kids who are spies or kids who are bank robbers. Um, and I'd never seen one that had been done before about a kid who became a political organizer. Also, when I was Maddie's age, I volunteered on my first political campaign, which was for the mayor of Newton, Massachusetts. And I loved being involved in that campaign as a kid so much. You know, I've volunteered for many, many political campaigns and causes since then, but being involved with it as a kid and my very first one has had such a lasting impact on me. And it's something that I wanted to put into a book and show a character doing. I hope the kids will like the book because obviously it's a fun story, it's funny, the art is terrific, it's aspirational, again, imagining a kid doing something that normally you wouldn't think a kid would be able to do. But at the same time, there's obviously an educational component. It doesn't get into partisan politics, it doesn't talk about Democrats or Republicans or anything like that, but it talks about what the role of government is in our everyday lives and why it's important for kids to care about that, pay attention to what their government is doing, and get involved. And, and it talks about, it shows kids that they can have an impact if there's something that they want to have happen in their community. And I hope that the book will not only entertain kids, but inspire them. Hi, my name is Lorian Lawrence. I am a middle school English teacher from Connecticut, and I'm also the debut author of the spooky middle grade series called Fright Watch. And the first book in the series is called The Stitchers, and that will be out August 18th from Abrams Amulet. And I can't wait to share this spooky world with all of you. Um, it's meant for readers who are between the ages of around 10 to 14, you know, kids who are into 
slightly creepy, spooky things. It's a cross between Goosebumps and Stranger Things, that kind of vibe. And I'm excited to tell you a little bit about it. So the Stitchers follows Quinn Parker, who's our protagonist. She's this 13 year old track star who starts to suspect that there's something up with her neighbors. Um, she nicknames them the oldies because they don't seem to age. They aren't getting, you know, necessarily younger. They're just kind of staying in the same space in terms of age. And there's something sinister about them that she can't quite put her finger on, but she does know that her dad, who passed away a year before the story starts, she knows that he was also curious about the, the neighbors and, you know, how they were able to stay fit and young and have been around forever. Everybody knows of them. There's legends, there's rumors, but no one has really dug deep enough to find out the truth until, of course, Quinn. And so Quinn enlists um, Mike Warren, who is also 13. He's also on the track team. He goes to her same school. He's kind of a friend, kind of a crush, um, but he joins the investigation and the two of them dive headfirst into this mystery and they, you know, go around town and collect clues along the way until eventually they do uncover the truth. And the truth about their neighbors is actually way more wild and horrific than anything they dreamed up. And so then it becomes up to them to, you know, expose the secret and put a stop to it. And that's it. I had so much fun writing this book. This book is my whole heart and soul and I hope you like it as well. Thank you. Six or seven years ago, I came up with the first tendrils of what will become the art of saving the world. So in the time since then, I released three novels. I coined the own voices hashtag. I started the Visibility and Kidlet website. The art of saving the world got written and sold and bumped and bumped again, and now, finally, years later, it's happening. Under strange circumstances, but it's happening, and that's what I want it most. For this book to be out there, reaching teenagers' eyes. In a nutshell, The Art of Saving the World is about Hazel, a sheltered girl from a small town in Pennsylvania who turns 16 and discovers she is the chosen one, meant to save the world. But the powers that be have no faith that she'll succeed. So they cheat. They use a loophole. They pull other versions of Hazel from other dimensions, there to serve as backup. Suddenly, Hazel is faced with a version of herself who wears dresses, something she never does. Another version of herself who has dyed rainbow hair instead of her own natural blonde. Hazels who are exactly like her in some ways, same teeth, same glasses, same love of Twix candy bars. And Hazels who are so different, it's like they're from, well, another dimension. And then they have to save the world together. There are dragons and trolls. There's defective interdimensional portals throwing stuff into our world at random. There's semantic disputes with the powers that be. And all in all, it's fun, it's silly, the concept is weird as hell. But I hope it's a lot more than that too. One of the reasons I love reading and writing sci-fi and fantasy is because of how intensely you can explore an idea. If I want to touch on the value of optimism and community in desperate situations, or to examine the way disabled lives are treated as disposable. What better way to do it than to put an autistic girl in the center of an apocalypse, like in my second novel, On the Edge of Gone? If I want to explore topics of identity, consent, and bodily autonomy, why not do so in a body swap novel like my debut, Otherbound? There was a lot I wanted to explore in the art of saving the world. Some of it I faced myself. How frightening it can be to doubt what genders you are or aren't attracted to undiagnosed anxiety and panic attacks, how harsh teenage girls often are on themselves, far harsher than they'd ever be on their friends, how our self-perception is often skewed, realizing that every tiny decision can completely change your life, your sense of self. And I wanted to explore issues related to fantasy stories and the way we talk about them, the unrealistic demands we have of fictional heroines, the expectations placed on teenagers in chosen one scenarios, and experiences we don't see enough, even now. Girls crushing on girls, asexuality, anxiety. And what better way to explore those topics than to literally place my main character eye to eye with herself, to see herself and learn to value herself the way others do. I wanted to write about all of that, but with dragons. And I'm so grateful to get to share the end result with the world. 
Hi, my name is Diana Ma. I'm so excited about Eris Apparently, my new YA novel about a young actress filming on location in Beijing, China. One thing I would love for teens to take away from this novel is the importance of fighting for one's beliefs. Gemma, the main character, is an actress and she is fighting for authentic and fuller representation of Asians in film. And she is doing this while she's also looking for love, she's dealing with a family secret, and she's eating a lot of good food. So there's lots of food in the novel. I hope you enjoy that. Uh, thank you so much for all your hard work in getting this book into readers' hands. Thank you.